Hello and welcome to Complimentary Colors. I'm joined today here with Kara Rood. Hello. And our guest, Ashley Killian. Hi. And Ashley is our ff &E specialist here at MCG, and we're excited to welcome her to the conversation today. So you guys ready to dive into the topic? Yeah, let's absolutely. Do it. Okay, so alphabet soup. What is it? First of all, I just need to warn you, listener, it's not going to be as dry as you think. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't give me a recipe. <laughs> Something to eat. Something to eat. There we go. Ashley, Ashley wins the gold star yeah, for the I day. <laughs> so yes, uh, alphabet soup is technically alphabet soup. But yeah. fun fact, mm -hmm. um, our old president, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, coined the term after he deployed what he called the New Deal series, where he put a hundred new creations of like federal agencies out there, and they all had names, and then they had. Thank Short you, names Parks. and acronyms yes. and blah, blah, blah. So he was called the alphabet soup for the New Deal. So I thought that was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Also, pop, pop quiz question here. How old is actual alphabet soup? Like the, the stuff that's like <laughs> the uh, stuff you actually watered eat. down yeah. spaghetti sauce <laughs> with like weird noodle shaped things. Sure. Macaroni. <laughs> 100 years. <clears throat> More. Ooh, what? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Seriously? Campbell was not the first creation mm. here. Stop. Yeah, I know. Uh, 1867. Wow. Wow. Isn't that kind of crazy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it used to be like little stars macaroni, and then they're like, hey, let's make something new. And so they made, I think, like an A, and then they realized that after they made it and they went through the heat process, it kept the shape really well, so then they just made the whole alphabet. <laughs> Wow. Well, that's fun. So, and then also fun fact, it's not called alphabet soup. It's called vegetable soup. So if you're trying to find it because wow. I've inspired you <laughs> to but eat why? If my kids hear it's this, really they're going to be like, soup. why have you kept this from me my whole childhood? And I'm going to be like, <laughs> because we don't eat the things that are. <laughs> yeah, anyway. But it's vegetables, mom. <clears throat> it's got healthy yeah. stuff in there. <laughs> uh, well, the reason why we're talking about alphabet soup is because I think our industry seems to speak in code sometimes with all of the acronyms and abbreviations we have, uh, especially with like not just the programs, but our acronyms and our literally codes for materials. It, it kind of just goes down, down and down a rabbit hole. So I thought we'd talk about it and yeah. talk about the ones that we care about so that... <laughs> We can kind of expand our horizons with our uh, audience and see if we can highlight some new fun facts for everybody listening in. So I, like I thought it. we'd highlight, first of all, a question of what letters do you have after your name? And if you don't, which ones do you want? To mm. have? So Carol, I'll start with you. What letters do you got? It's funny. I think the last round of business cards that we did, I was like, take them all away. I'm just, <laughs> it's so um, long. You have too many. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm a accredited professional on a few of them. So AP, so I'm a well AP and a lead BD and C AP. Um, you could put NCIDQ, which is our testing after that. And then our uh, national association, which is ASID. So it does start to get this weird alphabet soup. Right. Veneer <laughs> of like, ooh, you think you special, you know, <laughs> when doctors are like MD and you're yeah. like, wow, that's enough. And <laughs> we have a whole separate line on business cards. So, um, but yeah, those are mine. And most of them are all centered around uh, sustainable design practices, which I could get into later. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, uh, I don't have lead, so I've got the well AP. Um, I've got CHID, which is certified healthcare interior design. I've got the ASID and CIDQ, um, and then CT, the construction technician mm. <laughs> for the CSI industry. Way too many acronyms. Um, and Ashley, you were talking the other day of the ones that you wanted to get. Which ones were those? Yeah, so right now I just have Allied ASID, um, which is what Kara said, the uh, professional organization. Um, but NCIDQ is kind of like the holy grail, I would say, of the acronyms for interior designer. Um, you know, it goes through the qualifications of, you know, you have to have a, in, a degree in interior design or architecture with the focus of interiors. 
Um, and then I think uh, one of our coworkers, Casey, was talking about how hard it is to pass the NCIDQ. Oh, so she was. The, she was just talking about it. It's an intimidating test. So, um, you know, I did spend 10 years in like the commercial furniture industry. So um, doing just furniture wasn't as important at the time for me to get my NCIDQ. But now that I'm here, uh, it's something that's, you know, it's, it's more important for me now. So that's something I'm definitely going to work towards. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy how the federal government requires it too, whether you're working on the furniture or interiors <clears throat> packages of their, right. their spaces. So I think that's really a great goal to get that. Um, yeah, we just, that's why Casey's not here. <laughs> She's yeah, taking her she NCAA was, to yep, She was studying doing that. Yeah. All well wishes on that one. Um, and Kara, can you explain the lead and well one for us? Yeah. Our I'd like to. Attributes. Um, so LEED is probably the, it's the largest building rating system in the world. Um, it stands for leadership and energy and environmental design. Um, I think why it's so widely known is because similar to NCIDQ, it's been established as a standard for places like California and anything federally owned. So our federal government also requires that as a third party standard that we are pushing that, um, the envelope of doing better with what we have. And, um, you know, if you haven't heard, we'll talk about later the Paris agreement and 2050 goals for our industry yeah. to really keep pushing that boundary, um, of reducing greenhouse gases. So, um, I would say, and I say when everyone's like, what's well, cause <laughs> not as old, you know, me, it's, it's newer, under a right? decade. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say if lead was high school, you know, that well is like college. Um, so LEED has always mostly focused on the building envelope and making it very efficient and its systems efficient. And well was like, well, let's take it to the person. So it focuses more so on policy and the wellness of the inhabitant. So the um, features in it became more people focused. So you have things like um, mental wellness in there. You have olfactory, which is sense of smell. You have things that have to do with um, social equity, you know, how you hire. So a uh, more policy and less building systems have been focused on with. That's a really well. good point. And you might be thinking like, well, how, how do I know about all these things? And I would agree with you <laughs> in that statement. Um, I think when we found well, we were at uh, Neocon 2016, right? I think it launched in 16. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. And we were um, listening to the, the pitch. <laughs> from the founder <clears throat> I am forgetting his name I apologize um but I remember looking at you going this 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 is gonna matter <laughs> mm -hmm. and sure enough I like you said lead used to be it has adopted more of what well has brought to the table and research over the last decade so you'll see that lead v4 right we're in mm -hmm. uh piloted 4.1 but there yeah you go. Mm -hmm. it has a little bit more of that well, synergy <laughs> for the people and I'd even agree. the furnishings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would mm -hmm. agree. And you hear wellness being a need in so many things. I think uh, as a society, as a first world society, <laughs> we have embraced the fact that mental wellness is just as important as physical wellness. And that used to not be the case, I think, even five years ago. People weren't, it was a little faux pas still to talk about, you know, mental and social wellness. Now it's like front and center of everything, I feel like. Definitely. It is. It's yeah. on topic of conversation, for sure. Um, well, on top of the certifications that are alphabet soup, we also have to follow all the codes <laughs> that are alphabet soup, which I think is fun. Um, but We're such nerds. We're like, codes are so fun. <laughs> yeah, so if you ever hear us talk about ICC, that's you know International Code Council, NFPA, that's our life safety stuff, FGI, that's all healthcare. So we'll talk in code as much as we want to talk in code, but we are apologize in advance <laughs> that we're talking in code. I think 2015 was a pretty big year in the industry. Not only for the industry, but personally too. I think it's kind of funny that what you joined MCG in 2015, you got engaged in 2015. I got pulled into MCG the end of 2015. It was, it was, pretty, it was a pretty badass year. Mm -hmm. So I think that one thing that I want to highlight is an initiative that HKS put together back in 2014, which was called the Mindful Materials Initiative. And in 2015, they basically 
were like, wow, this, this is, this got some traction. So they launched it to more design firms. And I know that when you started MCG, you were one of the first people to join in on Mindful that. Materials. Yeah. yeah. You want to explain how that started? Yeah. Um, so I think ILFI, which is the um, International Living <laughs> more, Business. More I know. <laughs> and so so um, ILFI really uh, put a highlight on the Red List materials and that was in 2015, a big stick for me. So they're the chemicals of concern that affect human health. And um, the ones we're talking about are the ones specific to our building industry, which are in our um, materials that we specify. So we started to, you know, need ways to filter out things that were unhealthy before they even made it into the doors of mm -hmm. our firms. And so we started to clean out our libraries and there was, you know, firms associated with ILFI that um, all felt the same way. And so we started to collaboratively work just like in a Google Doc. Yeah, you know, we were just like it. sharing information and it became it was pretty grassroots. And then it again, it grew. Um, you know, it's a non for profit now, but I would say it was just a way to give everyone that we were meeting with that represented different product lines a baseline expectation that we could hand them the same letter that they've gotten every single time that had all of our logos on it and was like, we need transparency about what you're telling us to use in these buildings. And yeah. this is, you know, the reason why. So Knowing it was a, a really big ask of our manufacturers because wh what's one of the big ingredients that Try and take out of everything. Yeah, PVC, you know, <laughs> and phthalates. And I think that one got the most traction. It was like Definitely. of our of the generation of transparency and in interior materials, it's like the asbestos. Everyone, you it's know, can PVC hear now, that yes. and they're like really good to hide asbestos. I think the general population understands those things are harmful for us, but um the general population doesn't understand that, you know, uh a lot of the materials that you buy from your, you know, local DIY store, uh, still have a lot of that in it. So we, yeah. we started to try to have, um, a gatekeeper, if you will, with this, this letter that we all would sign. Well, that's how you start change too. It's Absolutely. firms like ours, you know, that reject these, uh, products and, you know, the more firms that do that, the more traction I think we'll all get. Yeah. And it's not easy to do that. I know that we had to have mm -hmm. a lot of hard conversations um, I remember specifically a pretty grumpy, <laughs> grumpy manufacturer that uh, was complaining about how much stuff he lugged up the three flights of stairs to only show me two books out of the whole suitcase. Um, I was like, well, you won't bring them up next time. I uh, gave you an email and the letter explaining everything that we're doing. So thank you for the two books. We'll take them. <laughs> right. But then a great example is also um, a rep that I've known for almost a decade. You know, Kate Crandall, she represented Tarquette and Johnsonite. And there was some time there where I was such a purist only because I was so new to mm -hmm. this red list free. And I was like, if you represent anything <laughs> that I can't use, <laughs> I just need to be a purist right now. So I understand that I can yes. stay, you know, to my goal. That said, we stayed in touch all the time and she's a wonderful wealth of information. And it was just a couple months ago that Tarquette itself yeah, had a sustainability to to, yeah. summit in Park that? City, Utah. It was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, they opened it up to just people that wanted to have a conversation about where we are going, you know, what in a regenerative like? industry, um, you know, to try to go beyond just the base level. And so um, it's because, you know, she kept that relationship alive. So yes, I think there was some disgruntled interactions when we kind of put our, you know, our line in the sand, but um, there was those that took it as an opportunity. Oh yeah. And then they were so happy when they got a product that can come back in our library. I just remember seeing all the smiles, like you're going to love this. Right. So we're like, yes. Yes, we are. Right. <laughs> we're starving for these things. Um, but I think that's really cool that you, uh, our education from our sustainable push and passion led to 
joining forces with the U.S. <laughs> in, in reality, bigger firms that were doing the same thing and asking for the same transparency, joining forces really created something that was larger than they ever thought it could be, I think. Like when it started with the Google Docs, and now it's this huge framework that mm -hmm. currently in 2023, it's being piloted by a huge company. <clears throat> Excuse me if I pronounce this wrong, but Economies? How do you... Eco mm. Yeah, the, the yeah, eco the common eco <laughs> eco there you go. But it is super. just referred to now as the common materials framework. Right, but the eco is the S <laughs> Here's another little. <laughs> you ready for this? S A A S. What okay. do you think that sounds like? Psh. Yeah, I know. I had to look it up too. Software as service. So they're basically the framework that all of this information lives on, which mm -hmm. was awesome. They host everything from federal governments to hospital, like they're huge. And to see Mindful Materials start this framework for the- mm -hmm. The Common Materials yeah, Framework, exactly. absolutely. Um, it's really cool to see how that has evolved and it hasn't even been a full decade yet. So it kudos awesome. to Mindful Materials. Well, Keep supporting you as we move forward. Um, make those ripples turn into- Make the ripples, exactly. Waves, the so, handprint yeah. matters. Mm -hmm. um, Let's start. Also, we've got, like you had mentioned, the Paris Agreement. So you want to tell us your story on the Paris Agreement? Because I think that's really funny. Oh, yeah. So I'm hanging out in Paris. Uh, <laughs> the day before this happened, I had just gotten engaged because the man was smart enough to not like in propose. Paris. Very <laughs> smart man. Oh, well, to not propose to me on my birthday. So we had <laughs> gone to Paris to celebrate my birthday. And we're at the Eiffel Tower having like a moment. You could imagine I just got engaged. And so we're like, you know, like swooning. And there's everyone it, it's the entire you know like Lanai, courtyard in front of yeah, me yeah in front of um and it, i mean i would have to say 20,000 at least people just swarming and i was like oh my gosh this is you could feel the energy in the air and it just was kind of the backdrop to my moment yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't until a few days later when i was on a flight home that i read that it was the Paris Agreement that kicked off like December 12th, which was my actual birthday, mm -hmm. uh, 2015. And so um, it was just a really wonderful, I wish I would have gone up and actually listened to everything. Cause <laughs> if now, you would have known, you probably would have. Serendipity but, right there. Right, because you, that, um, <laughs> you know, what the United Nations did for the, it was the Climate Change Conference um, is what it was called. But, you know, it was, for all of these countries to come together and say that, yes, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and we need to lower the temperature. And um, it was just, you know, this coming together. And a lot of things have spurred in our industry off of that. You know, these 2030, 2050 goals. Yeah, it's really planted a good seed. It really has. So it was, um, I'm sure, so much effort to get there. But Right. Nice you know, it really it has affected everything we've done since. Yeah. And they're um, they're voluntary. It's you know, you, you submit a plan <clears throat> as a country to um, have this end goal of reducing the temperature, or keeping the temperature reduced <laughs> and also um, helping finance the developing countries to be mm -hmm. able to accommodate to handle climate change because it is changing and it is changing a lot of what their common world is doing. So it's a really great program to uh, be a part of. And I think it was cool when I was looking into it that this year <clears throat> they're assessing the progress so far because it agreed on in 2015 and it got implemented in November of 2016. So we're definitely in that renewal of let's look back, let's see what's happening. So if you're curious like me, they haven't come out with like the full report yet. But if you keep following the global stock take, um, you'll definitely get a lot of information on where we've, where we've come as a global community from the Paris Agreement, which that alphabet soup, you ready for that one? Hit me. <laughs> Go for it. U-N-F-C-C-C. -C -C. <laughs> wow. I know. Long one. I didn't, yeah. United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. There we go. Yeah. So. You know, we haven't even... We haven't even hit like your specific ones. Yet. I know. So one of the ones Get we work there. with a lot is BIFMA. What's BIFMA? BIFMA. That is um, kind of the, I would say it's kind of equivalent to lead in some ways. Well, actually I'm getting ahead of myself. That's more level. So BIFMA <laughs> is the standards for um, business and institutional furniture manufacturer association. That's what it stands for. 
Um, it's kind of like the one voice um, for the commercial furniture That's industry. A good way. Yeah, so it's uh, there's a lot of different manufacturers that um, have kind of come together, and this uh, kind of keeps them all in check. And it's like everybody um, gets on the same page mm -hmm. with wanting to make a difference and wanting to be better for the community. And um, uh, Bifma, I think, started in uh, the 1970s, and before that, it was kind of like the Wild West. Like manufacturers yep. could just. Um, say like, oh, you know, our, our chair can support up to 400 pounds, but there's really nobody going and testing and For like qualifying that. Yeah. <laughs> so you, it was more of like a marketing ploy. Um, so um, BIFMA uh, started to have the standards and um, it tests on, um, and, and it's for the commercial furniture industry, the contract furniture manufacturers. Um, they test on sustainability, performance, safety and wellness. Um, so those are kind of the, the markers that it, it's for. And then you be, can, can become compliant and reg, there's a whole registry of furniture mm -hmm. on BIFMA um, that conform to the BIFMA safety. Yeah, and that's a big one for our federal clients as well. So right. under that um, big umbrella of the codes I was talking about, we've got ANSI. <laughs> right. And ANSI is that third party um, platform basically that will help these other certification tracks stay third party and verified mm -hmm. so that neutral nothing, territory neutral, neutral territory that's a really really great way to put it um, so then there's within BIFMA they then developed level um, which is more focused on the sustainability side um, so that's like the lead is that that's okay. that's more so uh -huh. the lead of the Notice furniture industry yeah <laughs> Um, so within level, there's, um, three different levels <laughs> that you can go. And the reason they do that, you can be level one, two, and three certified. And that kind of opens it up for, cause there's larger corporations that probably, um, are already doing these things, but that kind of having the different levels gives a chance for the smaller manufacturers to, you know, be able to get their foot in the door mm -hmm. and then get level certified pro products. So it kind of opens it up to, to a lot of different manufacturers. And I believe right now there are about um, 80 brands that are registered with BIFMA. That's a lot. So yeah, there's a lot. And then I'm always <laughs> seeing more and more Do added. you guys see why we have an FF I specialist? <laughs> I'm like, detail, detail, I detail. I know. The it's devil's a in whole the details. New, <laughs> it, it is a whole new world that you live in though. I yes. mean, it is like a subculture within our already subculture. It is. It's, it, I feel like furniture itself is its own little ecosystem. It's like it's like its own. I'll just describe a task chair. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many features in just a task chair. You have the arm adjustment, just height, width, depth. You've and that's got the even lumbar. You've got the generalized, seat pans, you've got not the tilt. even like the ergonomic ones, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I could. It's, I could go on. See. It's like, so you know, I, I love that. You know. Yeah. It's a little crazy. It's, and I, I think it's cool that we have uh, the ability in our firm to to find those passions and those details that we really run with. Um, I think that that's something that <clears throat> I think our firm does really well. Like, I can't know everything, so I'm going to know this, and you're going to know this, and you're going to know that. It's teamwork. And then we all lean on each other. Yeah. yeah. And I think BIFMA and Level Specific also helps us as designers not have to go through all of the weeds again, too. Right. Yes. All these certification programs are being made for us to be able to make quick, educated decisions mm -hmm. because we know that they're third party certified for the qualities and attributes that we're looking for already. So I think it's really great. Please keep consolidating. Well. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's so nice to go through. You can even go to their website and there's all, you can search by manufacturers and see what's on there. So it's just, it's kind of a easy, um, when I'm writing my specs, you know, I just go to the level websites where the manufacturers. Yeah. And I would, and I would say that crosses, you know, even to the bigger Models or platforms that we were talking about earlier with Well and Lead, you know, they have these, they call them crosswalks mm, where they're trying to, point. and it's the same thing with the uh, Living Building Challenge mm -hmm. or their material. The pedals. Right. So, you know, everything kind of started to align. And so as you pursue one certification, you can start to work towards the other. So, I, I think that's really beautiful when organizations do that because it starts with, you know, admitting the problem, mm -hmm. you know, and then it continues to data collection and then hopefully synergies align to where it makes our job easier. Yeah, yes. because I think we all have a common goal, like you're explaining. Mm -hmm. So if everyone is aligned with the transparency 
and um, the Red List Free products that we were talking about implementing in that joint venture in like 2015, uh, it's come a long way to be able to not have to literally be a chemist sometimes, where mm-hmm. you're given that um, HP or e- all of those documents is just go like, the wait HPs a minute, and, that yeah. HPD, no, that's not good. <laughs> and you right down rabbit holes. Like, oh, yeah, major <laughs> rabbit holes. And they're hole. so hard to read. I mean, <sighs> yeah. So hard. Talk about greenwashing to a T. Yes. yes. Um, so it helps so us be able to filter through and know that we can rely on these businesses and nonprofits um, to really supply us with what we're really looking for. Like the end goal is accepted by all now and not not as pushed back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I completely applaud the furniture industry specifically because if we take a chast chair again and we look at all the parts and pieces that that chair has, it's not coming from the same countries even. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they have to track down Materials. all of this information yep. from other worlds, it feels like. So yeah, that's a problem for that. Yeah. Yes. So I think that... Um, Letters aside, what do you guys feel is the most impactful movement current, currently going on? Like, what's the most bang for the buck? I feel like I might repeat myself on another podcast, but circularity. Ooh. Yeah. Explain Re- more. <laughs> uh, reuse. Mm. You know, um, new life. Yes. Like, all of this data collection and all of these resources that we have to collect data and to categorize should be used to turn trash into this weird thing like landlines that our now generation don't even know what that is. So (laughs) they should be like, what's trash? Because they're like, trash doesn't exist. Just like it doesn't exist in nature, it shouldn't exist in our world that's imposed itself Mm -hmm. on nature. Um, can I Trans- just say, Trans- if there's a video of this, can we please get me doing this? Like, imposed, because <laughs> that was, like, very aggressive puppetry. Um, anyway, okay. But I would just, I think circularity absolutely would be um, the thing that I think is getting traction. And there's all of the, the well and the lead, you know, they play into that, you know, deconstruction and, um, you know, reuse and reclaimed and, yeah. you know, it's playing into that same movement. Um, but if there was an acronym or a way to really well, there is. continue, Ooh, what is it? I think it'd be the cradle to cradle, right? Oh. Full circle. Mm-hmm. And then that acronym is right. C2C. Mm-hmm. Uh, really creative but yeah so you're talking about cradle to cradle the full circle closed loop everything is something else at the end of the day mm-hmm. um, or can be has the potential to be absolutely I I think that that's really um I think it's starting to come out in fashion wouldn't you say yeah. I'm currently wearing all um, thrifted <laughs> clothes. It's like my new jam, Cut actually. Thrifting. Yes. I love yeah. that. Thrifting's one way, and then yep. the recycled plastics. Mm-hmm. With, um, what is it? Rothy's, right? They're all oh, yeah. bottles. Coke bottles. Coke bottles. Mm-hmm. And I was recently um, in London, and we learned on that uh, boat tour, yes. which I thought was, like, mind-blowing, uh, that all of the trash in the city is brought to a central location and burned. Incinerated. And that, yeah, and that ash is used to make brick that then they build new buildings with i was like what and like, the gas is used to heat the homes yes it it's was just, just a really cool close full circle yeah yeah way to go london i thought that was yeah really cool. and i guess you know just to push it to reuse a little bit over recycled mm-hmm. is that if we can reuse a product in its current form, without having to use energy to do it yeah. without mm-hmm. having to like give it a bigger carbon footprint i think that that is so beautiful Mm -hmm. you know like we're looking for wabi-sabi and we're looking for meaning and stories and all of the things we do are in our industry and that's built in to Mm -hmm. um this reuse story Mm -hmm. Uh, we were at the museum for an asid event and i noticed that they had these um coolers that they that they used as seats and they just put like this little um fluffy like faux fur blanket over it. I'm like <laughs> that's such a fun idea they have all these leftover coolers and let's turn it into something else yeah, a piece of furniture yeti coolers. to sit on so <laughs> I'm blanket. totally with you on the circularity of um of things it's it's something I noticed that there's so many good things out there when I moved initially from Alaska to Georgia I got rid of everything and I'm like wow I'm getting rid of some really good stuff 
you know, even just down to furniture for, you know, personal homes and um, not commercial necessarily, but it's like we can all do better by finding these things and reusing them and fixing them up. And mm-hmm. yeah, they're already made. They're already created. We don't need to go and use resources to make more. Yeah, so. just give them new life. Yeah. The purpose they were created. I'm mm-hmm. snapping. I'm snapping. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to be a little different, I will go with the well because it's in the new attraction and it is for the wellness of the person inside the building. And I think that the education that we're getting and all the science that we're collecting, especially after COVID (laughs) has really proven um, the importance of integrating that more into our built environment too. We've really, like you said, we've got lead down. Like we've got the building efficiency envelope down. Um, We can now add to it with the efficiency of the inside and making it better for somebody to spend what, how much percent of their time? Are we at 96% yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. of our lives are indoors? So much time. So if we can make so it a little bit better. we're responsible for so much of your life. <laughs> <laughs> we touch it all. Well, and with lead, it's like the building, but, you know, it goes a, a level deeper with the furniture and oh, making yeah. sure that. What are you interacting with when you go to a building? Are you going and touching the walls and the floor and the ceiling? No, you're actually touching the furniture and you're inter- interacting with that. And oh, I think it's the Who wants forgotten. to explain the fabrics and why we ask for them to be, be naked. naked just because we <laughs> like to say the word naked um well because of all of those let's say stain repellents or water repellents that they're putting on they're topically applied most of the time so imagine something that is flexible you know a fiber let's just say like a blanket or a sweater your grandma knitted (laughs) so you could imagine how flexible that is and then you're just gonna like spray that with spray paint Obviously, as you bend and as you use it, that's going to start to flake off. And on a micro level, it's flaking off and it's soaking into your skin. I mean, can I'm just going to say it, uh, asparagus. We all know, <laughs> right? Like things that are, like they are in your body and like we yes. all know they're in your body. And so what, I'm, what we're saying is that when we ask for things to be naked, we're saying we do not want an extra layer of toxic chemical to interact with anybody that will be touching our product. We want to make sure that those things inherently like wools inherently do a lot of these things without a topical treatment that we are um, not adding more toxins that you have to deal with on a biological level. Yeah. The Nature's big one, figured it out. Nature has figured it out. Yeah. Biomimicry for mm-hmm. sure. Um, the big one we're trying to tackle, which I think we're doing a really good job with industry, is the fire retardants, right? Mm-hmm. That is something that we absolutely need to have safety in our buildings, in our homes, <laughs> so that we can exit the building when we're in crisis. So we understand the reason why they were created. And now we're understanding the science for why, you know, we figure things out. Like we implement something, we use it, we learn, and we adapt. So we're in the ad- adaptation mm-hmm. mode of figuring out how to re-engineer some of these things because you know sheets is a good example pajamas Pajamas. i was gonna say children's pajamas (laughs) pajamas, that they almost have to have that right now because of the fiber content it would just melt onto your skin right so these right but you could have a warning and i guess exactly (laughs) anyway so we're all learning i think everyone that was a prop 65 that you see on Mm -hmm. everything because california is heading it all up Um, I think big time on the fire retardant one too. Um, But I'd say in the last five years since asking for these um, naked fabrics that they literally, I think it's momentum or they like literally say naked on the back, which I thought was really funny. Yeah, Architects maybe. (laughs) Architects. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they're coming into figuring out that what we're asking for, they're giving us. And if someone needs to add it, they can add it later, but they're also figuring out a way to bake it in the cake Mm -hmm. and not be a applied on top so I think that that's we're doing everything we can with the information and all of those alphabet soup acronyms and codes that we have to deal with what ASID what was that American Society of Interior Designers I caught that one I was like hmm, I don't think <laughs> we, we didn't mean. say that one yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're everywhere so we apologize again for talking in code we don't mean to it's just part of our language um, but we thank you for listening today and if you have anything else that you want us to explain that we might have said just ask us yeah do that <laughs> Calm it up. what is this and we'll be like mm, let me tell you the history of the rhyme <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, polyvinyl chloride is what PVC is, just in case. So if you want something on Amazon that doesn't have PVC, you look for PU, polyurethane. Polyurethane, yeah. Yeah, which is not easy to find. But There's going to be a silicone. whole other podcast <laughs> on the differences in, like, lesser of evils. Not, not evils. evil, just exactly. lesser of evils. But thank you for listening, and we hope you had a good day. Thank you, Melissa. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye. Complimentary Colors is a production of MCG Explore Design, an architecture and interior design firm located in beautiful Anchorage, Alaska. If you'd like to hear more future episodes, be sure to subscribe to Complimentary Colors wherever you find podcasts.